terra firma has never been all that firm. A restless planet, it tosses and turns, shifts and shakes, sometimes catching man unprepared. But the great drama of the Earth unfolds like a slow motion dance, almost imperceptible to man. All that he knows of it are clues from the dim past, which turn up in unexpected places. On a mountain top, hundreds of miles from the nearest ocean, the fossil of a marine animal that swam the seas 560 million years ago. At the bottom of the world, in the icy wasteland of Antarctica, the bones of tropical animals that roamed an equatorial forest long before man evolved. These clues and a flood of other discoveries led scientists to a new theory of the Earth, one that has revolutionized man's thinking about his planet. as a rock, expresses man's centuries-old belief in the Earth's permanence. Within his lifetime, it is. But men and mountains do not share the same time scale. Rocks, which symbolize solidity, are the key to the Earth's dynamic nature. If the medium is the message, that of the rocks is inescapable. Their layers contain a history of powerful forces that have moved mountains and shifted seas. Slowly, man learned that the Earth he inhabits has not existed in the same form since creation. Mountains have risen, only to be worn away. Vast seas have covered the land and then subsided depositing particles and animal remains in layers and layers of sediment. Volcanoes have ruptured the Earth's surface, evidence of enormous turbulence deep within the Earth. But few people connected these violent outbursts with the slow, almost imperceptible changes of mountains and seas. Those who did see a connection came to a revolutionary conclusion, one that shook tradition and orthodoxy to their roots. Not only were the rocks that make up the continents dynamic, but the great land masses themselves had moved across the face of the earth. Alfred Wegener, a German scientist, was the most determined proponent of such a view. In 1912, he published the most controversial theory in the history of geology, continental drift. According to Wegener, all the Earth's land masses were originally clumped together in a supercontinent. Over several hundred million years, it broke apart. To support his theory, Wegener had collected some impressive evidence. He pointed to mountains of identical structure scattered across the Atlantic Ocean like pieces of one great mountain range that had broken apart. Wegener then pointed to the jigsaw puzzle fit of Africa and South America, and to the discovery of similar fossils on these and other continents, indicating they had once been joined. Yet Wegener did not succeed in convincing the scientific community. To many, continental drift was a joke. Oceanographers were particularly unimpressed. From 1912 until the early 60s, they believed that the seafloor was made of solid rock like the continents. How, they asked, could rock plow through rock? Dry land yielded no answer. Tools to study the seas did not exist, 
So Wegner played a hunch. The ocean floor, he predicted, would one day prove to be completely different from what anyone expected. Ocean research on a large scale didn't begin until 20 years after Wegner's death. In the 1950s, money and technology were finally available for an international effort. Ships from many countries cooperated in a gigantic undertaking, mapping the ocean floor. A depth recorder became man's eyes below the ocean's surface. Sonic pulses bounced off the ocean floor, returned to the ship as echoes. These echoes provided a profile of unseen terrain that covered almost three quarters of the Earth. To obtain the thousands of profiles needed to chart this vast area, many ships spent several years crisscrossing the oceans. Gradually, a general map of the ocean floor emerged. Wegner's hunch was right. Its features were totally unexpected. Volcanic peaks, abyssal plains, deep trenches, and winding around the globe, a 47,000 mile ridge of mountains, longer than any on land. Had Alfred Wegener been alive, he would have seized on the location of the Atlantic portion of the ridge, exactly midway between the continents, as if a seam, once holding them together, had split. While oceanographers came up with a completely new view of the ocean floor, on land, seismologists, who study earthquakes, added another amazing detail. In 1960, an international network of new supersensitive seismographs was developed. For the first time, seismologists could measure the intensity and pinpoint the location of every earthquake that occurred around the world. Each quake was recorded as a dot on a global map. And another startling fact emerged. Instead of occurring randomly, earthquakes were concentrated in narrow bands alongside deep ocean trenches and at the mid-ocean ridge. The forces that shook the land seem linked to some powerful action at the bottom of the sea. A few scientists believe that action just might have something to do with Wegener's old theory of continental drift. Among them was Harry Hess, a geologist at Princeton University until his death in 1969. To Hess, the findings from the new earthquake and ocean studies were only pieces of a great earth puzzle. In the early 60s, he put the puzzle together. The ocean floor, he believed, held evidence of a dynamic mechanism, convection, heat currents rising from the Earth's molten interior, like currents in a simmering cauldron of soup. In this case, the cauldron is the entire Earth with its three main layers. A core with a solid interior and a molten outer portion. a dense plastic layer, the mantle. And surrounding it, like the shell on an egg, a thin, rigid crust. On top of the crust are the oceans. Embedded in it are the continents. Hess and others believe that the continuous atomic decay deep within the Earth's interior heats material in the mantle. The heated material rises, setting up convection currents. The rising and diverging column of mantle material exerts stress on the rigid crust, creating submarine mountains, the mid-ocean ridge. At the same time, 
This slow volcanic action causes the crust to break into gigantic sections, or plates, which are forced apart. As it cools, the molten mantle material fills the space between the plates and solidifies. This dynamic process of breaking, moving, and filling continuously creates new crust as the old is moved away from the ridge. The ridge crest marks the boundaries of the moving plates, which carry both oceans and continents. The rate of movement would not break any speed limits, only a centimeter or so per year, or about the length of a man's body during his lifetime. That's why it took 100 million years for Africa to separate from South America. Because the mid-ocean ridge snakes its way around the planet like the stitching on a baseball, a plate moving away from the ridge on one side inevitably meets a plate moving toward it from the other. What happens? Does the earth swell and expand, growing bigger and bigger? Hess believed that the earth's size remains constant, that when two moving plates meet, as at the western edge of South America, something has to give. Seismic studies suggested that the edge of the eastward moving plate is bent down several hundred miles into the mantle. The bending action creates an ocean trench along the continental edge, a trench as deep beneath the ocean as Mount Everest is high above it. On land, there is uplift as the two interacting plates crumple the continental edge into mountains. In this case, the Andes. The plunging motion of the downward moving plate sets up stresses, which sometimes cause the earth to quake. This explains why seismologists discovered earthquakes concentrated in bands along the deep ocean trenches. Such a quake shattered Peru in 1970. Several towns were wiped from the map and more than 50,000 people lost their lives in South America's most devastating earthquake. But the end of the world for several villages was only a faint ripple in the ongoing evolution of the Earth. Miles below the Earth's surface, a descending plate, which causes such disasters, eventually melts to be recycled in the Earth's dynamic system. As the plate moves down, its lighter materials rise and often explode in volcanic eruptions. Whether at the edge of a continent or in the middle of an ocean, wherever plates interact, volcanic action occurs. Sometimes an island is born, such as Circe off Iceland, a surfacing peak of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. The Earth sciences finally had a global theory, seafloor spreading, a force powerful enough to sever the continents and divide the seas. Only one element was missing, a crucial one to scientists, proof. Part of that proof was discovered by Dr. Frederick Vine, a geology professor. Vine did not set out to prove the theory, but he did see a connection between seafloor spreading and findings from a seemingly unrelated field, geomagnetism. Just as the poles of a bar magnet radiate an invisible field of force, so a similar field of force surrounds the Earth, for it too is a giant magnet. At any point on Earth, the strength of its field can be measured, as well as the direction, which changes. 171 times in the past 70 million years, the Earth's magnetic poles have inexplicably reversed. The North magnetic pole becoming the South. A record of each reversal is frozen, like a compass needle in the rocks. In 1963, 
Dr. Vine happened to see the results of a survey of magnetic changes in an area of the ocean floor. Each change showed up as a stripe on a diagram. Vine was particularly intrigued by the regularity of the stripe pattern, as if lines had been painted along the ocean floor. To Vine, the pattern was a clue, a possible link to seafloor spreading. It was well known that as lava rises and hardens, its iron oxides retain a detectable record of the direction of the magnetic field. Vine reasoned that if volcanic action was creating and pushing new ocean floor away from the mid-ocean ridge, each new avenue of crust should have retained any magnetic field reversals as accurately as a gigantic tape recorder. This could explain the striped pattern but Vine wanted a more conclusive test. In 1963, he had the perfect opportunity. The United States Naval Oceanographic Office's specially equipped aircraft was taking magnetic readings over a portion of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge where seafloor spreading was strongly suspected. Reykjanes Ridge, submerged off Iceland. It was in this general area that Surtsey later appeared. On board, a magnetometer, basically a sophisticated compass, measured changes in the Earth's magnetic field. Day after day, the plane crisscrossed the ridge and recorded magnetic profiles. Analysis of all the profiles resulted in a striking piece of geological art. Again, the striped pattern appeared. Most significant was its symmetry. As Vine had expected, the stripes were spread out equally on each side of the mid-ocean ridge. Such symmetry was possible only if new ocean floor had also been spreading out equally on each side of the ridge. Both seafloor spreading and continental drift now had to be taken seriously. The clincher came from those who were once its strongest opponents, oceanographers. For evidence, they went to the bottom of the sea. A deep ocean drilling project was launched by several American scientific institutions in 1968. Looking more like a floating oil rig than a scientific research vessel, the Glomar Challenger was specially designed to carry out the most intensive ocean floor studies ever undertaken. Towering from her deck, the Challenger's derrick was built to take cores, or samples, deeper than any previous coring vessel, deep enough to penetrate the ocean's bedrock, where clues to its age and formation lay buried. On board was everything both scientists and drill crew would need. Thousands of feet of drill pipe. A computer. And a fully equipped laboratory. During her first series of voyages, the Challenger crisscrossed the Atlantic and Pacific, 18 months in all, collecting samples throughout the ocean floor. Whatever was happening down below, the Challenger was going for a piece of the action. Unlike an ordinary drill bit, the Challenger's has a hole in the middle through which cores are drawn up. As the bit is lowered, hundreds of feet of pipe are added until the bit reaches bottom. There it bores through sediment, fine particles that settled through the ages building up layers on the seafloor. Several scientists aboard still opposed the theory of seafloor spreading. Others accepted it. Those who accepted it expected that cores taken near the mid-ocean ridge would be younger than those taken near continents.
But scientific disputes are settled by evidence, not by argument. The cores would speak for themselves. They would prove or disprove one of science's most revolutionary ideas. While drilling goes on, the ship is held in position over a pinhole thousands of feet below. Instead of a conventional anchor, propellers at each end of the ship accomplish this tricky maneuver. Using signals from sound beacons lowered to the ocean floor, an officer can control the propellers to move the ship in any direction, even sideways. Drilling went on around the clock, in depths as great as 25,000 feet below the ship's hull. In order to obtain a complete picture of the ocean floor, the Challenger took cores at many sites, from the mid-ocean ridge to continental edges. Sometimes more than 3,000 feet of sediment were penetrated, providing scientists with the deepest ocean cores ever retrieved. Encased in a protective plastic wrapper lining the drill pipe, each core stretched across the deck like a cable linking man with the time before he evolved. What story would it tell? For easier handling, the core was sectioned. In each length of sediment, thousands of years of Earth's history were compressed. Slicing through time, a geologist prepared samples for analysis. A few handfuls of sediment might hold the key to events that had shaped the entire planet. Each core was a volume of Earth's history. Just as volumes of books are collected in libraries, so, at the end of a voyage, ocean cores are collected in repositories, like this one at Lamont Doherty Geological Observatory, near New York City. Here, scientists have the ocean floor at their fingertips. Here, the real detective work goes on. All the mysteries of the ocean's past are hidden in the cores. The color of sediment is a clue to the conditions which formed it. Dark, coarse sediment is typical of the ocean floor near a continent, where swirling currents continuously wash material from land. Here, sediment builds up rapidly, one to several feet per thousand years. This deposit may have been caused by a sediment avalanche, the kind that sometimes snaps submarine telegraph cables. Further away from a continent, the sediment is thinner and its composition changes. No longer built up by rock and dirt washed from land, this sediment is partly composed of fossils, the shells of planktonic animals that oozed from the surface to the bottom of the sea. Fossils are the most important clue to the ocean's past. By knowing when fossil animals lived, Scientists can use them to tell the age of the sediment in which they lie embedded. These fossil radiolaria are made of silica, similar in composition to window glass. In the geological time scale, they're youngsters, only 55 million years old. Although these forms are now extinct, their descendants are abundant in modern seas. Amoeba-like creatures, they secrete shells of fantastic shapes and thrive in nutrient-rich waters, such as equatorial and polar seas. A second kind of ooze sediment, also found far from land, consists primarily of shells of other planktonic animals. Foraminifera. These fossils, whose shells are made of lime, go back 150 million years. They too have descendants floating in modern seas. Consisting almost wholly of fossils are cores from near the mid-ocean ridge. Not surprisingly, the sediment is thinnest and youngest here, 
suggesting that it had less time to accumulate. The cores provided scientists with unimpeachable evidence for seafloor spreading, evidence that makes the Challenger's voyage as significant as Darwin's voyage on the Beagle. The cores with their fossils prove that ocean basins are young, much younger than the continents. Unlike continents, the ocean floor consists entirely of volcanic rock. At the mid-ocean ridge, the bottom layer of sediment and its underlying volcanic rock are youngest and become progressively older toward the continental edges. This could be true only if new ocean floor was continually forming and being pushed away from the mid-ocean ridge. Alfred Wegener, Harry Hess, Frederick Vine, The Challenger. Based on their work and that of others, the Earth sciences in little more than half a century moved from speculation to fact, or as much of a fact as anything in science can be. Sea floor spreading, a discovery that many Earth scientists consider the most important of the 20th century. Our view of the Earth has totally changed. Scientists have given us a new global geography, no longer a static arrangement of land and water, but a collection of dynamic plates carrying continents and oceans across the face of the Earth. Hundreds of millions of years from now, today's geography will probably seem as remote to the dominant species of that time as Wegener's supercontinent does to us. As the Americas move westward, the Atlantic will continue to widen and the Pacific will become much smaller. Severed from North America by the sliding action of two moving plates, California may become an island. The Mediterranean may be closed up by land. Even man may be extinct. His civilization only fossil remains on the bottom of some future sea or on top of some desolate mountain. The not-so-solid Earth, mobile, changing, evolving, a pulsating rock moving to the beat of its own time scale. On this video cassette is protected by copyright. It is for private use only, and any other use, including copying, reproducing, or performance in public, in whole or in part, is prohibited by law.